So last week, in case you missed it, we were in Mark chapter 9, and we were on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus. He was glowing brightly, whiter than you could ever bleach anyone's clothes with any bleach on planet Earth. His disciples, three of them were with him, Peter, James, and John. They had this mountaintop experience with the Lord. That's where we kind of left them last week. So we're going to pick up the rest of the story today in Mark 9, because he was on the mountain, and now he's going to go back down into the valley. So would you pray with me before we get started? Let's pray together. Spirit of God, we invite you to come here. We know you're already here. We invite you to move among us, to speak to your people, to bring healing here, Lord, and to speak a word that is life-giving to each one of us. In your name, Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. So last week, to close my sermon, I asked you the question, have you been to the mountaintop? Have you actually been to a place where you've met Jesus experienced him, touched him, feel like you've been in a place where you knew he was really real, he was really with you. Um, I've definitely been to the mountaintop multiple times. I'm a longtime camp speaker, so I've spent 30 years at camp. Camp is a place where we often go to the mountaintop. And it's interesting because you can't manufacture the mountaintop. It's not something you can make happen as a speaker. It's something that only the Lord can do. So at a camp, you give space for Jesus to move into the camp and kids meet that Jesus, and they're approached by that Jesus in the mountaintop. I've had several profound mountaintop experiences at camp over the years. One of my most profound was in Colorado Challenge several years ago. I invited kids to spend 15 minutes of silence reflecting on the hardness of their hearts, the places where their hearts had become like stone, because the enemy had done things to them in their lives that had caused their hearts to become stone-like, especially when it came to God and relating to God. They went out for 15 minutes in silence, and I asked them to bring back to the chapel at the end of the 15 minutes a rock that represented what was going on in their hearts and their lives that they could you know, find out there when they were on the mountain praying before God. Kids started pouring back into the chapel. Some kids carried rocks this small. Some kids carried little pebbles. Some kids had boulders that they had picked up, like the heaviest rock they could find, and they were like struggling to get it into the chapel. We had put a cross up front in the chapel, and we invited kids to come forward and to bring their rock to Jesus and to lay it before the cross. What happened over the next hour could only be explained by the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in these kids' lives. I mean, one after another, young and old, came and kneeled before the cross and put these rocks before the Lord, and the Lord did mighty things. It was a mountaintop experience. Now, over the next couple days, it was crazy because every kid, they were high on Jesus, right? And they just kept telling me, Klein, we got to just stay here on this mountain. Like forever, just live here on this mountain. If we just live here, it's going to be way better off. I don't want to go home. I just want to stay here. Well, that's not really unlike the story in Mark chapter 9 that we started to dig into last week. They had been to the mountaintop getting to see Jesus' glorious display, and now the disciples want to camp out there. Look what Peter says in Mark chapter 9. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And we'll just live here on the mountain. Now, what I always have to try to explain to kids is, here's the problem with staying on this mountain. If we stay here, we're going to be here. And all of our junk is going to be here. (laughs) And so eventually, this mountain will become a lot like life back home, right? The mountaintop experience we have with the Lord will melt away, and we'll just be here together on this mountain. Mountaintop experiences remind us of how present Jesus is, how real he is, how powerful he is. But once you meet Jesus in the mountain, you have to go back into the valley and go back to the battle against the evil forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. Once you meet Jesus on the mountain, the enemy will be actually waiting for you at the bottom of the mountain, always, to try to destroy what has happened to you on the mountain. Our Mark 9 story illustrates this well. The two characters that appear with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, Moses. Moses had a mountaintop experience in the book of Exodus, right? Went to the top of the mountain, saw God, got the Ten Commandments from God with his, written with his finger, came down glowing, and what meets him at the bottom of the mountain? A golden calf and a total circus going on in the camp. The enemy was in the camp. 
Elijah, who also appears with Jesus on this mountain of transfiguration, he also has a mountaintop experience. He climbs Mount Carmel with 450 prophets of Baal and all kinds of Israelites around, and he calls fire from heaven, and it miraculously burns up this altar that he's made before the people of Israel. And then he goes down to the bottom of the mountain. Who's waiting at the bottom? Jezebel. And she says, Elijah, I'm going to make your life like the life of one of these prophets by this time tomorrow. Jesus and his disciples, they have a similar experience. They have this mountain of transfiguration moment. Then they head down the mountain and look what's going on at the bottom. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. What are you arguing about, he asked. Now, you'd think the disciples and teachers of the law would answer the question, but that's not who answers. Instead, a man from the crowd answers this way. Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. From the mountaintop experience of Jesus glowing back to the valley and the demon-possessed kid and the disciples' failure to drive this demon out. Now, I don't know when you hear the word demons what you think. Most people today think it's a bunch of hocus-pocus, like ghost stories and stuff. Like demons, really? Come on, that was like old Bible stuff, right? You need to know that John Mark, the writer of this gospel, firmly believes in a personal supernatural being and beings as a fact of life, part of reality. He believes in the existence of these beings, and he believes that Jesus has power over these beings. Now, this does not mean that everyone is possessed by demons, like the boy in the story, but it does mean that we are all fighting against the powers and principalities and forces in unseen places. Even Jesus himself was not immune to this. He found himself in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the enemy, Satan himself. In addition to Mark, the biblical writers assume that there are demons that exist on planet Earth that are fighting to destroy people's lives and take people out and steal any abundant life that people want to have on this Earth or in Christ. I can tell you that at camp, I have encountered demons just like this one. I remember the first time. I was on, on the mountain in Colorado. It was midnight. This young man walked into the chapel where we were sitting praying, and he literally fell on the ground and looked just like this kid in the story, flopping around, foaming at the mouth. He couldn't talk, couldn't speak. We went over and carried him to the stage. We began to pray over him. This went on for 10 minutes. It was kind of freaky. After 10 minutes, he sat back up was perfectly fine. Now, of course, everyone thought, well, he has epilepsy or something, right? He's got something going on physically. That's what caused this. So when we got home, his parents ran him through a battery of tests at the hospital. Nothing was physically wrong with this kid. For some reason, in that moment, this demon decided to rear his ugly head in this kid's life. Now, I'm going to tell you that is not Satan's normal strategy because he can't win that battle. He doesn't want you to see him. He doesn't want you to know he's there. He wants to work in the shadows, under the scenes, scheming, pretending, moving about in ways that you don't normally think of. He doesn't want to kind of show his face and be out there. But here's the thing. As Christians, even though we don't often see these crazy kind of things like in this story of Mark, we have to know that there is this enemy that is trying to destroy us. And there are two equal and opposite dangers when it comes to, comes to evil and thinking about evil. One is to completely disbelieve it, that it doesn't exist. The other is to, in an unhealthy way, excessively focus on evil. John Eldridge writes this. He says this, To live in ignorance of spiritual warfare is the most naive and dangerous thing a person can do. It's like swimming with great white sharks dressed as a wounded sea lion and smeared with blood. And let me tell you something. You don't escape spiritual warfare simply because you choose not to believe it exists or because you refuse to fight it. You are going to have to fight for your heart. The thief is trying to steal the life God wants to give. So folks, we live in the valley, not in the mountain, and we are in a battle, whether we like it or not. This is just the truth. There is an enemy 
who wants to rob us of any kind of abundant life in Christ and take us out, literally. Now, I think we can learn a lot about what the enemy is up to by looking at this boy and his father. The father has already explained the symptoms to Jesus, gnashing of teeth, throwing himself in the ground, and becoming speechless, right? Jesus tells the father and the people, bring the boy to me. The spirit in this boy throws the kid on the ground immediately, and he starts foaming at the mouth and rolling around on the ground and having this big attack. Now, if this is epilepsy, it's very coincidental that it would happen just as this guy is brought to Jesus. He falls on the ground, and all this starts to go on. Because when demons are in the presence of Jesus, it's painful for them. They're in the presence of the king of kings. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been going on? Look what he says. From childhood, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. What? Now, parents, I don't know if you can get this. This father is like one of my heroes. I don't know where mom is. Maybe she's so discouraged, she just stayed home. She's so exhausted from chasing this kid around and keeping him from throwing himself in the fire or drowning himself or, you know, holding him while he writhes around in the ground. I don't know. But dad is fighting for his kid's life. Can you imagine the pain and anguish this guy's been in for years? Holding his kid, hugging his kid, and somehow he learned or he figured out this is a kid who's possessed by a demonic evil spirit. He told Jesus that. He didn't suffer from denial. He wasn't trying to pretend. And now in this one desperate move, he brings the boy to Jesus. And his plea to Jesus is this. Jesus, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, Jesus, take pity on us. Help us. Look what Jesus says. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the person who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. In the Greek, literally, he yelled this. He screamed it in desperation. This father is awesome. He's vulnerable. He's honest about his doubts, about his faith struggles in this moment. Can you imagine trying to believe that Jesus could do something when your kid's been doing this since childhood? You've been chasing him around and going through this forever? No wonder he doubts. I'm sure the religious leaders have told him that his kid was like this because he did some sort of sin where his wife did. Jesus would have none of that. Now, I can't help but think that this boy's condition can give us a picture of our own inter internal spiritual struggle and condition. What's the enemy want to do to you and me? He wants to paralyze us internally so that we cannot in any way, speak the word of God, hear the word of God, or function in abundant life of Christ. He literally wants to harden our hearts with all the junk he throws at our lives to make our hearts into stone to keep us from having any spiritual passion for the Lord. He wants to deaden us on the inside so that we cannot function, literally. Literally. This kid is like a picture. You know, Jesus and these healings he does, he talks about spiritual blindness. He, talk, he connects blindness to spiritual blindness. And this one, it's interesting. He doesn't really connect it verbally, but it's like you can see it. Like his primary goal, the enemy's primary goal is to keep you from and to destroy the movement of the living God, the resurrected Jesus in your spirit. To keep you flopping on the floor, unable to spiritually function. I probably would sum up our experience with Jesus this way. We meet Jesus on the mountaintop, but we live for him in the valley. We live every day in a place where the enemy is at war with us and trying to directly throw us into chaos all the time, drawing us, enticing us, trying to get us to agree with his way of life. Because once we agree with him, that gives him a way in. Once he gets in, he just keeps working his deadening, paralyzing, spiritual deadness in us. This is our story. This is our battle. And we need to remember who we follow. 
Oftentimes the Bible calls the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The Hebrew translation of that is way better. The God of angel armies. So we literally follow the God of angel armies who has his angels at his disposal and can send them any time to our aid. So our posture in prayer needs to be the same as this father in the story. He is humble. He is honest about what's going on with his kid. He doesn't try to soft pedal it or cover it up or make it sound better than it is. He acknowledges his total powerlessness over this situation. He says to Jesus, I, I can't do anything. In fact, I don't even know if you can do anything. But I love how he brings the boy to Jesus. Brings him to Jesus. This morning, it strikes me that many of us probably walk around with these inside. If I would have been able to do this, if this wasn't COVID this morning, I would have had a pile of rocks all over the place and you would have had a rock when you came in or I would have told you to find one. Some of you might have carried boulders in this morning because whatever you're carrying on the inside has completely paralyzed you and you can't even function. Some of you might have carried a rock like this. But I know that the enemy has planted these rocks in our lives, these places where our hearts have become like stone by a consistent and constant pressing and battle against you know, the abundant life in Christ that you can enjoy and have. If I could have done this this morning, I would have had a cross up here. I would have told you to take a rock that represents whatever it is that's going on inside of you and bring it to Jesus. And your prayer could have been the same as the Father's. I believe, Jesus, that you can do something about this. Help me in my unbelief. Help me in my desperation. I've tried and tried and tried and tried. I can't seem to defeat this thing. It just keeps coming back at me over and over again. You know what I'm talking about? The stuff that just we can't seem to shake. It just keeps bringing death to our lives over and over again. The Lord wants to heal that. He wants to resurrect that. He wants to do for you what he did for this kid. At the end of the story, Jesus tells the demon, get away from this kid. Leave him and never come back inside him again. And the people think the kid's dead on the ground. They're like, this kid's dead. Jesus walks over. He picks him up by the hand, stands him on his feet, and he's free. His rock-like, paralyzed life is done. He can now live the abundant life he was meant to live and be everything that, that God told him to be. There's one last verse here. The disciples, after they get in private with Jesus, they actually ask the question of Jesus, why couldn't we cast this demon out? Why would they ask this question? Because if you read Mark chapter 6, they were sent out two by two, and they came back celebrating that even the demons listen to us in your name. So here they are in Mark chapter 9, and this demon won't listen to them. They can't free this kid of the demon. Jesus gives us a little line. He says to them, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. So we're about to enter the season of Lent. Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday. It's a 40-day journey toward the resurrection, toward the cross and then the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This is the journey that Jesus is about to begin right here in this story. He's about to begin the journey to the cross right after this story. Start walking toward Jerusalem where he'll be killed for the sins of the world and then eventually powerfully raised from the dead. Lent is a great time for prayer and fasting. It's a great time to think about what could you lay down, what could you put away, what could you fast from so that you could spend some extra time just thinking about this stuff and bringing it to Jesus in your life. Sometimes the things that we're facing, the rocks we have inside, they can only come out by prayer and fasting. They're not going to come out like this. They're going to take a little longer, a 40-day journey. So some of the stuff that we're carrying with us, it's not going to just instantly come out unless we're willing to go on the prayer and fasting journey with Jesus over the next 40 days and ask him 
to lean into this stuff that's inside of us and weed it out, heal it, cast it out, and tell it never to come back again. So I invite you to go on this journey. I don't know what yours is. You know, I have a box at home with letters from kids from camp. It's like 30 years of letters. So when I come home from camp, often I get a letter, like several letters from kids. They write me notes or letters, and I usually save those and look back on those. Just because I want to remember um, God's amazing, mighty work when we lean into him. So reading those stories, those kids' testimonies, gives me hope and power to know that Jesus wants to continue to heal people. So I was reading those letters this week in preparation for the sermon, and it's unbelievable the stuff the enemy throws in people's lives, in people's way. Pornography. Parents who don't get along and then blame their kid. Uh, Family troubles besides that, uh, rebellion, drinking, acting out, blowing off your schoolwork, uh, low self-esteem. I, I mean, I could just keep going on and on and on. Some of this lives inside of us, but the enemy knows how to get in there and just kind of twist it until it becomes this. and keeps us from really being connected to the resurrection power of Jesus. So when I go to camp, I just offer a chance for kids to come and for Jesus to speak to them and to say to them, whatever this is, take it away. Take it out of this kid. Don't ever let it enter again. So my hope is that we'll have testimonies after this Lenten season of all the rocks that Jesus has removed from our hearts, from our lives that we'll have done the hard work of actually sitting quietly, looking inside, and asking Jesus to show us what are those stones that are keeping us from really pursuing you passionately with our whole heart? And then bringing those stones to Jesus, letting him do what only he can do. No preacher can do, no church can do, no Bible study can do. Only Jesus can heal these stones. Only Jesus can cast out demons. Only by the power of the name of Jesus is life given, right? Are we renewed and resurrected from the dead? So let's make that our Lenten journey this year. Okay, church? You with me? I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to be with you. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, we're super thankful for the mountaintop experiences that you've given us in our lives. Things we can look back on and we can remember and cling to, Lord. Knowing that you are as real in those experiences as ever. And then, Lord, we know we have to go back into the valley and live our lives. And there we find that we're under assault, under attack by an unseen enemy that we can't even really put our minds around. Jesus, help us to understand how the enemy is working in our lives. Help us to identify those stones, to call them for what they are, and then to bring them to you. Jesus, I pray that this Lenten season, you would do a great healing work in this church, in this community. In your mighty name, Jesus, your powerful name, we pray all these things. Amen.